Nebraska, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, New York City. He was the original weatherman on the uh, brand new ABC network morning program, Good Morning America. He stayed seven years, then formed the Weather Channel, serving as its CEO and president during the startup and its first years of operation. He is currently at a, uh, an independent station, K uh, USI TV in San Diego, in what he calls his retirement job. If we could all retire in uh, San Diego, I think we have uh, done something right. Uh, please uh, welcome John Coleman. It is the greatest scam in history. I am amazed, appalled, and highly offended by global warming. It is a scam. With those words posted on the website of the television station in San Diego, where I'm the chief meteorologist, I stepped out of the closet and into the spotlight in the effort to debunk the wildly out of control frenzy, uh, hysterical as it is, uh, about the supposed imminent climatic catastrophe of global warming. And how does it feel to be in the ring, duking it out with the doomsayers? In the words of James Brown, wow, I feel good. <laughs> I feel good because I know I'm on the right side in this debate. I acknowledge the sides are very uneven. On the other side, the United Nations, the leaders of almost every country in the world, the governor of my home state of California and almost every other governor, all of the current candidates for president of the United States, uh, virtually all of the Hollywood superstar do-gooders, just about every national media outlet in the world, and seemingly every environmentalist on the whole planet, half a dozen prestigious scientific organizations, lots of prominent meaning, meaningful science, almost every teacher in the world, and up to 80% of the people. And they all stand alongside, proudly, beside the Nobel Peace Prize winning, Academy Award winning, Grammy and Tony winning, <laughs> Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. So here I am, now part of the outcast, much assailed, way outnumbered group of <clears throat> deniers. <laughs> well, let me tell you, they call us deniers, and I'm tough. I can take it. I don't like it, but I can take it. And the reason I can is because I've decided that there really isn't anything to debate here. Being silent when I know that this side is right, giving lip service to the other side when I know they're wrong, dead wrong, that's not an option. So it all comes out to, I'm on this side to stay, and wow, I feel good. Now, my father was raised on a farm. He became a college professor, but he still had that farmer's habit of going for the walk in the evening to look at the sky, feel the wind, and predict the weather for the next day. And as a little boy, I loved to go along with him. And that's when I began to form my connection with our environment. That was way back in the mid-30s when the weather forecasts were <laughs> rudimentary to say the least. Weather data was extremely scarce and we were pretty much on our own predicting the weather. Well, I, I, that, that, that just stuck with me all my life. So then I became an employee of a pioneering startup television station in 1953 when I was a freshman in college. And one day the boss said, who knows something about the weather? And my arm shot up, and on that day I became a TV weatherman, and I have been walking in the weather and talking about the weather every day ever since. So the next day I went to class, and the professor looked down at me and he said, Mr. Coleman, I saw you on TV last night reporting the weather. What are you doing here in Introduction to Meteorology? <laughs> Everybody laughed. I answered, I'm trying to learn what I'm talking about. <laughs> and sure enough, all through college and for the 51 years that have followed, the pattern has continued with me. I walk in the weather, I feel the weather, and I predict it every day. And here I am in 2008 still doing it, and I do feel good. Somewhere along the way, perhaps it was about a decade and a half ago, I began to read about this global warming thing. I wasn't too impressed or excited about it. After all, 
I had been through the Ice Age frenzy in the mid-70s, and uh, so I wasn't scared. Nonetheless, I started reading about this global warming thing, and I listened to everything I could. I started researching. I got out the journals. I learned what I could. Now, listen, I'm not a research meteorologist. Like many of you in this room, I am your student. And I am a serious student, however. I'm totally immersed in my field of expertise. And as I study, I couldn't believe what was happening around me. There was this unprecedented explosion of global warming hype. All the media was filled with it, this bad news, the sky is falling. We have been warned of the dire consequences. Our civilization faces the coast will be flooded as the ice caps melt, the crops will fail, millions will die, and species will vanish as their habitats vanish. Panic sweeps the media, and new alarms are sounded every day, and it's gone on and on and on, and I've tried to stay cool. My studies have convinced me beyond a shadow of a doubt that the media frenzy is wrong, dead wrong, there is no unprecedented, unequivocal, undeniable, uncontrollable, man-made global warming, no evidence that it's happening now or it's going to happen. The entire frenzy is just so ridiculous as it can be. And people I meet ask me about global warming, and I tell them. I say, relax, it isn't for real. And you know, some of them get very hostile with me. People with no scientific knowledge and no reason that I can see to take a position have accepted global warming as their mantra, their religion, their passion, their cause, and it's finally risen to the point like Howard Beale in that movie Network. I just can't take it anymore. And when Mr. Gore was given the Nobel Peace Prize, and when CNN declared Earth a planet in peril, and NBC went green for a week and turned out the lights on a pregame football show, I virtually opened the window and shouted, I'm madder than hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and suddenly, I feel good. I wrote my rant and posted it on our website. The greatest scam in history, I'm amazed, I'm appalled, I'm highly offended by it. Global warming, it's a scam. That was in no mid-November. And since then, I've posted eight more briefs on our website explaining the scientific basis for my position on global warming. I have intensified my studies. I've entered the debate wherever I can. Man-made global warming is not a problem. There is no climate change. Now, right here, I'm holding up a document now. And I believe that this is the last remaining cornerstone of the global warming advocate's case. Now, this is quite a document, 113 pages long. The scientific paper that the United Nations uh, says is it's titled, Understanding and Attributing Climate Change. Chapter nine of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change documents. I wonder how many people who are the disciples of global warming have actually read that. And of those who have read it, I wonder how many understand it. And I wonder, you know, it, this paper, it, it portends to explain to us how CO2 forcing drives, you know, the rate of forcing of CO2 drives climate change. Uh, just a little trace compound in the atmosphere, the total force behind this uncontrollable global warming. Now when the global warming hype was beginning, it was the hockey stick. That uh, chart that was in Al Gore's book and in his movie, and everybody's attention was riveted on that hockey stick, and uh, it was reproduced everywhere. And I thank goodness for Stephen McIntyre and Ross McKettrick. They really led the charge to get that hockey stick chart knocked down the side. They showed it was a scientific fraud. Their papers widely published. They were joined by others. And uh, the peer debate took place. And as best I can tell, the hockey stick chart is dead. And I say, rest in peace. But there was more bad science that came. And that has been widely discussed at this meeting. With great fanfare, NASA began presenting papers explaining how the global warming uh, was making this year the warmest year ever, or one of the top 10 years in all history. And each year, we were told that the warming was building. And I'm so glad that it wasn't long before many experts, including my great friend and colleague, Joe DeLeo, and Roger Pelkey, and uh, Ross McKettrick, Pat Michaels, many people, Anthony Watts, Ben Herman, all began to explain to us 
uh, how it was, and they demonstrated it very well, that there was great inaccuracy in the data and manipulations behind those NASA documents. And at one point, in fact, NASA even, as most of you know, had to admit that they'd made errors and the warmest decade in U.S. history was suddenly shifted from the 1990s to the 1930s. And what has become clear of any warming that has taken place in the last 20 years uh, was very small, less than a degree, and was not totally, if at all, the result of mankind's activities. And urban heat islands and uh, the problems with weather instruments and the way that the data is excuse me, I want to say manipulated, I guess I should say the way that the data is handled, properly massaged to produce those maps or those charts, all of that, determining which stations to use, which stations not to use, all of that produces, well, what it boils down to is this. Those average temperature pronouncements are no longer of any general significance and no longer part of the debate. The, the, the global warming advocates have all failed to consider the climate changes uh, are natural and have been taking place since Earth was formed, and that it has, the Earth has continued to go through those and will continue to go through natural changes. That's all well documented. Solar cycles, which uh, several people have discussed with expertise here today, shifting ocean currents, which Joe is quite expert on, all have had a, a huge impact on the climate of Earth, much more than any CO2 forcing. So that brings me back to uh, this paper about understanding uh, the climate change. And this is the one. This is it. I think it's all that's left. I think it boils down to this whole thing. Carbon dioxide. The global warming advocates claim that the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere resulting from the burning of fossil fuels is leading directly to the uncontrollable warm up in global temperatures that will accelerate and produce our disastrous climatological results. It's all right here. And if that hypothesis is wrong, then I say their entire global warming frenzy has no basis. And this is indeed their last remaining cornerstone, their bottom line. They're done with the charts. They're done with the averaging of surface temperatures. All they have left is this. And so if we can prove that paper wrong, I think it's all done. If CO2 forcing isn't real, then they have no case. And I am confident, as I suspect many of you are, that CO2 forcing is not valid. I tell you without equivocation, I've read a lot of research papers, and I've concluded that CO2 forcing, that that whole hypothesis has just failed the test. The increases in carbon dioxide atmosphere were first measured and published by Ross, uh, Roger Revell, that is, who was an eminent scientist, the founder of the Scripps Oceanographic Institute, later a professor at Harvard University. One of his students was Al Gore, and Al Gore says that it was being in Roger Revell's class when he was first measuring the increases in atmospheric CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels that ignited his entire interest in fighting the global warming campaign. And isn't it interesting that in his later years, Roger Revelle himself said that we should be very cautious, making any assumptions, that CO2 was the engine of climate change. For all, CO2 is a natural compound in the atmosphere. We all know that. We breathe it out. The plants use it in photosynthesis. The oceans absorb it and release it. It's also in the exhaust, of course, of burning fossil fuels. And I think it's really clear that almost all of the frenzy over global warming comes from environmentalists who want to end the burning of fossil fuels. They try to blame carbon dioxide, and they try to make it a pollutant, and they say that, you know, we must eliminate it. And their case just doesn't hold up. It's not a pollutant, and eliminating fossil fuels will not in any way reduce global warming. Many well-intentioned scientists have done their studies that they say links carbon dioxide in the atmosphere with warming temperatures. Their historical evidence has been proven wrong, uh, but they clearly work on it. And still the, the CO2 advocates uh, say that the CO2 has this special way in which it influences water vapor. And it just amazes me. I mean, 
CO2 is 38 molecules out of every 100,000 in the atmosphere, a tiny fractional compound in the atmosphere. How can it have that much um, impact? Well, this one here, this paper I'm holding, uh, this is the one that really means it for me. I think that this paper answers the call. It's called Environmental Effects of Increased Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide. And this is the paper that was uh, written by uh, Arthur B. Robinson and Noah E. Robinson and Willie Soon. And I think it's absolutely convincing. If you haven't read their paper, I think you should, because I think it answers the debate on CO2 forcing. Now, let's get down to something else. When I discuss CO2 forcing with people around me, or just the general topic of global warming, they say, John, come on. The United Nations and its panel of 2,500 scientists have concluded that global warming is a major threat to our planet. You should listen to them. They are the experts. You are a heretic. And this is the hardest hurdle to jump. I mean, it's one thing to debate science. Now we're talking about people's view of the world's structure and emotion, and it's difficult to overcome, but I'm going to try. The International Panel on uh, Climate Change, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was established in 1998. I don't know if you've seen this, but an engineer named Alan Cheatham did a lot of digging and research how that was formed, why it was formed, what it's all about. And it's an amazing political story with an undercurrent of an effort to position the third world nations so that they could gain restitution, that means dollars, from the highly developed industrialized nations because of the pollution from their industrial activity. The history also documents how the politicians who were behind starting the IPCC were one world government uh, devotees. They had a dream of one world government and they wanted to entrench themselves in power. So here came the IPCC. Well, what's it going to do? Once you've got an IPPC, its goal is obviously to flourish. So it uh, spends its money to scientists who will produce documents that prove man-made climate change. Then it holds the meeting for them to present their documents. Then it calls in other scientists who are going to get money from its grants to do reviews, peer reviews of those documents. They write reports. They put out publicity re uh, uh, releases. Uh, they go to Bali in the end, and uh, they uh, compound and compound and compound until they have a huge budget, until uh, they are well entrenched. Now, you know, in contrast, what if the UN IPPC had determined within a few years of its establishment that there was no significant man-made global warming. Obviously, it would have been disbanded. The bureaucrats would have had to find other work. The scientists would have had to go elsewhere. Well, that's not going to happen. No bureaucrats going to allow that to happen. So now we have it. And there it is. 2,500 scientists, much is made of their consensus. And people like me are challenged by it. And uh, that makes it very difficult. Well, I thank Dr. John McLean who has issued a detailed report on the IPCC reviewers, revealing that there were as few as 23 independent reviewers of this primary chapter, chapter 9, and of those, only four explicitly endorsed its hypothesis. Well, that is a long way from 2,500 and from consensus. And of course, the lack of consensus is all so well documented by Don Vincent Gray, who spoke here this morning. And he is an expert reviewer, and he's been a member of the IPCC since its inception. And he detailed just how contrived that whole process has become, and how it has become a political instead of a scientific organization. That brings me to the media. Within the media, whatever the UN says goes. It's accepted as fact. So the UN says there's man-made global warming crisis. Its panel of 2,500 scientists is in consensus. That's good enough. And then you throw in a former vice president as the spokesman for the cause. Well, that's all the evidence the media needs. It's going to beat the drums on global warming. And so now global warming has become 
the American media's cause celeb. Now, I'm not the only television weatherman. Art and I aren't the only two either. Uh, I know of two, at least two others, uh, two dozen others, who have come forward and made statements. Uh, you'll find a list of their name on uh, ICECAP, uh, listed as experts. And I've heard from at least two dozen others who won't reveal their names publicly because of their employment situations. But let me tell you something. We are not nearly influential enough within the media to turn the situation. Now, Mark Morano, working for the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, has released an impressive list of 450 scientists who look, uh, took a stand against global warming in 2007. And there are thousands of scientists, we all know, who signed the petition against the Kyoto Protocol, and that's impressive. But in the media world, even that's not enough. Not for them. The only thing I think that would count with the media is we could have a network anchor defect or a um, Hollywood superstar join our side as the skeptics. So let me tell you a few things that I think will put it in perspective. The media is not going to do it, and I'm going to try. Through government, we create an orderly civilization, or at least a reasonable facsimile thereof. The media seems totally hung up on government and politicians. But I know, and you know, that the real advances in our civilization are the product of science not of politicians and not of government. Science created the health care that has cured me of cancer and has saved my life twice and now you know, gives me the medications to keep me enjoying life every day. And science has created the power and the machines and the systems that make it possible for us to travel in the air and along the ground at high speed and to warm and cool our spaces and light them. And science created our means of communications, our phones, our radios, our television sets, our internet. Most of all, science created the computers that extend our human capabilities by a power of millions. Science, not government, is the driving force in civilization. And that's why I made the point to fly across the country to be here today to honor you in science and your brethren around the world I know you are the prime force of our civilization, and I thank you, thank you, thank you. You are my heroes. Debate among scientists. That's the healthiest condition we can have, and we've seen some of it here so far. From disagreement is born more study and serious consideration and reconsideration. And to declare that debate on global warming to be over is anti-science. That's regressive and, in a word, dumb. I say, let this debate flourish. And in conclusion, here are a few things I think we should not expect. The UN is never going to withdraw its report. Al Gore is never going to admit he's wrong. The scientists who have developed the case for CO2 forcing and global warming will not admit they erred. Environmental extremists will never relent. But there are things we can work for. The media can be persuaded, I think, despite the fact that they've hardly shown up here for this conference in their, the media capital of the United States, the media can be persuaded in time and with continuing effort to give some coverage to our side of the debate. A significant percentage of the public through that media influence could change into skeptics. And as a result, some politicians who are always going to follow their poll of public opinion might come over to join our side of the argument. Those are the things we need to work for, and those are possible in time. And I'm going to ask just one question today. I'm not making a charge here, but let me ask. If CO2 is not the culprit in global warming, and they know it, is the selling of carbon credits a financial fraud? And now I'll paraphrase David Letterman. The number one thing I think we can expect in 20 years, we're going to have the last laugh. When the climate has not changed, when the ice caps have not melted, the shores have not flooded, when the polar bears continue to flourish, when the oceans are comfortable, when climate change has not destroyed our lives, we'll have the last laugh. And the frenzy will fade away and there will be global warming jokes Al Gore's prizes will be tarnished, and we will laugh. 
It's the greatest scam in history, and I am amazed, appalled, and highly offended. Global warming, it is a scam. But because we're standing up to the horde of global warming alarmists and doing our very best to set the record straight, to calm the frenzy and provide proof that the sky is not falling, and because of the work of all of you, wow, I feel good. Thank you.